here there were also some um, instances in which uh, people chased yields with uh, imperfectly perceived and imperfectly disclosed uh, risks. Uh, one thinks of the Argentinian bonds and then with the addition of some fraud, uh, Cheerio and Parmalat. And so as a result of all this, I think it's not surprising um, that Italian households and individuals are a little bit hesitant um, to move out on the risk return uh, spectrum or frontier, in part, I think, um, because they may suspect that they don't really know or accurately assess yet uh, the risks. And on that, later on, I'm going to suggest that is a, a, a very important part of the function of the other side of the market, the supply side. But compound interest does matter. And there will be, uh, may very well be excessive caution uh, here that needs to be overcome with improved education, with trust that gets built up over time uh, by the industry that many of you come from. Uh, but it does matter what consumers think and how they behave. This is a quote that I like. Uh, it comes from Sam Walton, who's the founder of Walmart. And he said, there really is only one boss, the customer, and that person can fire everybody in the company from the chairman on down simply by spending money elsewhere. <coughs> and this is a point that I think uh, we just need to, re to sort of remember. John Lipsky, who's the deputy managing director of the IMF, in talking about the current crisis, keeps reminding us that while we had failures of regulation and some other things, ultimately, what happened is that a lot of us voted with our feet, I meaning dollars, and, um, and did things that were distinctly unwise. There is a herd mentality in investing. Italians are not alone in having a propensity to buy high and sell low, uh, to get carried away with the enthusiasm. I I've been fascinated um, in this uh, last couple of years with the experience of contrarians. Uh, these are the people who, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, pick up warning signs and, and try to act on them. And generally, they're ignored uh, until it's too late. In fact, it's worse than that. If they manage other people's money uh, and they're actually hedging, then typically their returns are lower. Uh, than other people's returns, and they start, and that doesn't have to go on for very long, given the short time horizon that people use in measuring performance before they start l losing assets. Um, people chase yield and ignore risk. A, a friend of mine told me that uh, PIMCO has uh, two or three closed-end uh, funds that have high-yield bonds in them, that carry a premia of uh, 40 or 50 percent. I mean, that's extraordinary. Uh, a premium over net asset value of 40 or 50 percent. And finally, I think the concept of total return is not widely understood. People understand yields better. They use the terms interchangeably. Uh, and this is a complicated area. Well, one of the most successful investors in the United States is a man named Seth Klarman, uh, and the company's called Baupost. This is a company that buys uh, distressed and mispriced assets uh, when they can find them, really across virtually every asset class you can think of. And, but, but one way they mitigate risk is they like to buy things that are self-liquidating on a three to four year time horizon. And I think that's, so the truth is somewhere in between the yield on the one hand, the actual cash flows, and the total return, which we tend to use in sort of academic work or the endowment world on the other. So what do we need to talk about under this general heading of education? Well, I have, I mean, this is a huge subject. I have four thoughts I'd like to share with you today. <clears throat> the first one is there is growing complexity in the investment environment. Um, I'm on the board of the Stanford Management Company, which is the entity that manages the endowment at Stanford. It's not that big, but it's not small either. Uh, and, and it, it, but it isn't managed according to the endowment model. It's reasonably sophisticated uh, investment operation in terms of asset classes and so on. And what we have found, in part highlighted by 
experiences in the crisis is there's a whole set of challenges associated with managing assets effectively um, in this world. There's an asset class pr proliferation uh, that's bewildering. Many of those asset classes are not accessible directly to retail investors. Uh, many, many potential investments are really investments in strategies and not asset classes. That is, these are people who have an approach to investing and you can't describe it just by describing the asset class, timber, oil, you know, uh, and so on. Many, many of the hedge funds are characterized that way. There's a huge problem of knowing how much leverage you actually have. And when you sit down and actually try to figure out via the managers through to the investments how much leverage there is in the portfolio and therefore how vulnerable you are, it's very difficult to do that. I think we're now aware that the environment is dynamic and we have periodic bouts of what, what I call systemic risk. Systemic risk is a situation like the one we just experienced in which the normal correlations among assets and asset classes change dramatically and quickly and they become much more positively correlated. And then you have hedging and tail risk, uh, a widening array of geographies. The developing world is now on the order of 40% of global GDP and is certainly where the high growth is occurring. Not all, but some of those are really important, interesting investment opportunities that require knowledge and insight and a macroeconomic point of view and so on. Um, I won't go on. I mean, one of the big lessons of this crisis is that liquidity management is terribly important uh, for the reasons I mentioned here. One is, uh, if you don't pay attention to it, you have distress selling. Second, if you're, if you're really illiquid, and almost all the major institutional investors and many of their asset managers were illiquid going into the crisis. Uh, you can't respond to the warning signs. And finally, once the distress hits, if you're illiquid, you can't take advantage of the really very large investment opportunities that, that occur there. So why do I say all that? That set of things and working through them uh, on the part of expert investors uh, is, wh is what defines the evolving sort of risk return frontier in this, in this world. And what I want to say first is that the informational gaps and asymmetries between the people who wrestle with the kinds of problems that I just described and the retail investor is large and growing. And I think it's important to recognize that, that it's highly unlikely and unreasonable to expect that gap to be closed by financial education. Uh, this is more like medical care. If people invest a lifetime becoming expert in things and, and, and doing continuous education to keep themselves up to date, there will always be an informational and expertise gap uh, from one side of the market to the other. Part of the problem is that some of these asset classes are simply inaccessible to the retail investor, uh, but, it, but that problem can probably be solved. It, it's more a question of competence. So the bottom line, is that one of two things is going to happen. Either investors are going to be able to access risk return options as they evolve <coughs> dynamically in the global market um, and, and not be disadvantaged, but the only way they're going to be able to do that is through trusted and highly competent uh, financial agents and advisors. Or, the other alternative is that won't happen, in which case they're going to be operated in a completely different world where the gap between the investment risk return opportunities are just very different for the retail investors. 